Romans chapter 8, going to start in verse 1. Going to start in verse 1. And this is one of, I mean, chapter 8 of Romans is one of the most powerful theological books in the New Testament. It is an incredible, incredible uh, chapter that Paul pens here. And it, it, it's just a, it's good, okay? It's good. So I, I'm excited about this morning and I'm hoping not to preach too fast because I feel like God wants to speak to us today and I want to give you an opportunity to not just to amen, but also take some notes and have an opportunity to have your, your, your toolbox packed so that you can, can go out and, and put into practice these things. Let's read together. Romans chapter eight, verse one. It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That is a powerful statement, okay? I need you to highlight that, underline that. Remember it. There is now no condemnation for those who are what? In Christ Jesus. Key phrase, in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now, for several weeks, we've talked and gone through and we've, we've, we've created this foundation of theology and, and doctrine. And a lot of people will say that doctrine is boring at best and divisive at worst. But I believe doctrine is the most powerful thing we can cling to because doctrine is formed out of the Word of God. And the Word of God teaches us that it is the only thing that will go out and never return void. So it's important that we have this proper foundation of doctrine. And when he talks about the law, Paul here, we're understanding that the law only has the power to reveal our problem. That's all the law has the power to do. The law is not a bad thing. The law is a good thing, but the law is powerless to bring transformation because the law just shows us where we missed it, right? It just shows us where we missed it, how we missed it, what we need to do better. See, the law is God's commandment over our lives that he will judge, that he will look at, that he will, it shows us where we missed it. But now, because Jesus fulfilled the law, because of the price that he paid, because of that purchase of our lives through the blood of Jesus Christ, through in grace and mercy and redemption and restoration, all of those things taking place, now the law is powerless over us in a sense is that now the law is fulfilled in Jesus, okay? So now we're free to live for Christ because Christ is now living in us and through us. See, in Christ and in him or in the beloved, is about 216 times that Paul says this throughout his 13 letters. In us and through us, it's, it's a in Christ and in him and through Christ. And th there's this encouragement that he brings that the only way that we can live the life that God has called his followers to live is in and through him. Any other way besides that is a man-made effort and it's only going to lead to frustration. It's only going to lead to destruction. It's only going to lead to an emotional issue in our life where we feel like we're not enough. Now, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, we've all felt that at some point. And the good thing is, and the good news is, is we are not enough and we were not created to be enough. We were created to be in relationship with God the Father through Jesus the Son and him be enough in and through us. So that's the true grace that leads to Jesus and freedom and the law is powerless to bring that change. So in theology, we got to understand that we're created. And, and so in, in the theology that would be seen as a tripartite view, which is the trichotomy of man, the way that we're created, that we all have a spirit and we all have a soul and we all have a body. We have a spirit that must be redeemed. We have a soul that must be restored. And we have a body that must live surrendered. Submit so, see, in the spirit... You, we have to understand that we are spiritual beings. God created us with a spirit. And that spirit is created to live for an eternity. 
right? Whether we live in heaven with him or, or we suffer in hell forever. We all have a spirit and that spirit must be redeemed. And a lot of times in life, we think that we are a, uh, that this physical life is, is the forever part. But it's not. We are spiritual beings having a temporary physical experience on earth other than a physical being having a temporary spiritual experience. That's why we get it wrong so much. Like, I just had this great spiritual experience. Now, God created you with a spirit that he wants to redeem. And when he redeems our spirit, then we are righteous. We are made righteous through Jesus Christ and our spirit is redeemed. But then we have a soul, right? We know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. It speaks to this trichotomy. It's the soul is, it enables us to experience the relationships and appreciate the beauty of our surroundings, right? Our soul is made up of these simple parts. Our soul is the mind, which we think and reason with. And we know that our minds can be a terrible thing, <laughs> Our mind can play some tricks on us. We may hear something that may not be godly. Do you know that the majority of all of the struggles that you will deal with in life and that I will deal with in life will start with a thought? It will start in our minds. And so we've got to win the battlefield of the mind. Like our minds can play terrible tricks on us. It can make us think that everyone hates us. Because you don't realize that in this world, people are so selfish, they only think about what you did for a short season. Then they move on to themselves again. All you're doing, when people talk bad about it, is you're giving them a break from running their mouth about somebody else, right? The mind can be a terrible thing, or the mind can be a beautiful thing. We have a will. This is when we make choices, Right? We make these choices through our will. I, through my soul, my soul being restored, I am choosing. I am choosing this life that God has given me through the victory, or I'm choosing to believe that he's not for me. See, our spirit redeemed, our soul must be restored, and this is our emotions in which we believe, we feel, and also that we remember. Early on as a believer, I I didn't understand this part. Like, if I'm saved, then why do I feel these things? Why do I struggle this way? And, and, and what I've learned now is 20 plus years of being a follower of Jesus is that there is a constant tug of war that is happening because there is a spiritual battle. There's a spiritual battle that is taking place for our soul, for our spirit, for our body. There is a spiritual battle that the enemy wants to wreak havoc so that we don't live in the proper order of which God has created us. A spirit redeemed and a soul restored. This is the part that I would say that you are delivered, but you may struggle with some damage. Right? God has set you free, but there may be something that you're experiencing, that you're walking through that comes from a life that he redeemed you from. You wonder why this is the, the whatever a man sows, he, he will reap type thing. You, we can't sow bad seed and pray for crop failure. Every seed that we sow will come to pass. But when we sow righteous seed, what's going to happen? A righteous harvest. So when Jesus saves us, and our spirit is redeemed and our soul is in the process of being restored the way we think, right? The emotions that we have, which I look at as the foundation of what we feel. When I was monitoring and counseling in college, we, we learned that every person has core beliefs and those core beliefs are formed from the foundation of their mind, their will, and their emotions. Think about it. People will base their entire theory of life based off of their individual experience, thinking they're the only ones that have walked through something so tragic. Can I tell you that pain is the normal process of a life in a world that is fallen? 
So there are these opportunities, and we understand that we are in this struggle, in this battle, and in our soul being restored. Our soul experienced relationships, right? And relationships are a beautiful thing, but our hearts are broken through relationship. We've all had people that claim to be our friend that would desert us at times, and people will say they love us when really they only love us for what we do for them. They don't love us for who we are. Like, would people still love me if they knew every area of my life or known everything that I've ever done? You know what? People may not, but I can tell you who will. Jesus Christ. He will love you. He will love you with a passionate love no matter where you've been or what you've done. But he wants to redeem you and restore your soul. He wants to restore my soul so that I can have a biblical view in the way I process my mind, my will, and my emotions. You know how important it is for your emotions to be in order? I mean, the way you feel will dictate in your life <laughs> the temperature of which you live spiritually. I just don't feel saved. Well, I'm, I'm not looking for the feeling of being saved. I'm looking for the doctrine of being saved. Well, I don't feel saved today. My team lost. Well, it's okay. It's okay because your team has nothing to do with your salvation. Right? I just, man, I... My temper was bad. If I was saved, I wouldn't have a bad. No, you are learning to submit. So we have this spirit that's redeemed, the soul is restored, but this body that must be submitted, that must be surrendered, right? That's, that's the part of it. It's this, it's this Galatians type model that Paul writes about. He says, whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. But whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. So which one are we feeding? Are we feeding the spirit so our soul will be restored? Or are we feeding our bodies? Are we feeding our flesh? Are we feeding our carnal appetites? We have that decision to make every day. Which one are we? Are we going to feed the beast? Or are we going to feed the spirit? It's this surrendering. It's this not my will, but yours be done mentality. God, you've saved me. God, you're restoring me. I may, I may walk with a limp because of my past life, but thank the Lord he's letting me walk. I'm not, I'm not everything I should be, right? But thank God I'm not who I used to be. And the only way that I become more godly is by living a life surrendered to his call and his purpose. And this is the responsibility that we don't like in the life of a believer. So we get in this bad theology of things like sloppy grace and whatever. But the truth about it is, is the grace of God saves us and sets us free so that we can live free in him. Not free with, with inexcusable acts, but free to live and let Jesus Christ reign in our life so that we can live a life on purpose for his calling. Now, I know that it can be a struggle at times where we're like, well, did I, did, I, did I do everything I was supposed to do today? So we have this outside pressure that we feel. We feel like people are judging us. We feel like people are looking at every step we take. And have you ever noticed that people that don't know God from a man in the moon know exactly how a Christian should live while they don't live it themselves? Friend of mine, do you know what that is? A hypocrite. I don't go to church because of hypocrites. Well, if you know the truth and don't live it and act like you don't have an issue, then you, sir or ma'am, are a hypocrite. And you still live with yourself, <laughs> right? I mean, Walmart's full of hypocrites. The ballpark's full of hypocrites. It's all about the kids. You sure ain't acting like it's about the kids. We're going to put little Johnny in. At the end, we saved the best for last. Oh, it's tied. Little Johnny's got to go in. It's the rules. <sighs> It's all about the kids. It's all about the kids. Little Johnny, come here. Trip him and push him down. He's hurt. <laughs> little Johnny's hurt. He can't play little Johnny. Go get you a snow cone after the game. Cherry or grape, they're both favorites. All of us have this decision that we're going to make. It's, the, it's this living in order. Living in order. This is the order. My spirit redeemed, my soul restored, my body surrendered, my flesh submitted to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And the enemy wants to keep us 
out of balance. He wants to keep us out of balance. He doesn't want our soul to be restored. He wants us to remember every painful relationship that we've had, the soul ties. You ever notice that some, the, why it's so hard for someone to get free of a relationship where someone is extremely abusive? Like why is it that they can be treated like trash, cuss like an animal, and beat like one that is not, a, and just an absolute, just very dysfunctional situation? but they can't quite seem to break free. They use and abuse them. It's because their soul is connected. And the more and more that you connect your soul to people and they take advantage of you, the less and less you are likely to love and trust at the capacity that God has gifted you. It's where we feel like we need to isolate. But can I tell you, God did not create you with a spirit that has a physical body living in a temporary moment in time to be this isolated hermit. This person that pulls back and never loves anyone. Have I been hurt? Absolutely. Have quote unquote Christian people hurt me? 100%. But I'm not going to let the devil have an inch where I don't love people the same because it's through loving people. It's through loving God first and then loving people that I get the opportunity to see him have freedom and victory in people's lives and he gets the credit and the glory for it. I'm not going to let a, a negative experience in a relationship prevent me from becoming everything God has called me to be. But so many times we go, man, you know, I was growing up and the church hurt me. Look, can I tell you, the church didn't hurt you. People hurt you. People hurt you. Well, the pastor said that, look, pastors are people too. We're trying to figure out, right? It's this tug of war that we all experience. Like I think sometimes people think that when pastors get out of the bed in the morning that angels sing and they just walk on golden squares to the kitchen of an angel cooked breakfast and the spirit begins to talk. Not like we got to have like a, you know, a Red Bull or a coffee or... I, I can't even, I don't even know what voice that is talking to me right now. I, sometimes I wake up so, so, so bad off, I think my dog's having a conversation with me. You know what I'm talking about. Don't act like I'm. The, I've seen some of you post videos talking to your animal, acting like you understand them. We're praying for you. There is. There's this, and the enemy wants to keep us out of balance. He wants to create feelings in our life like shame and victimization. But we got to understand this, right? Can we just follow along for a moment? The enemy is what? He is the accuser of the brother, and he is the tempter of our flesh. He wants to divide us. Hello, COVID. Look, I don't, I, you know, I'm real careful about what I say and things about what is of God and what is of the, but I can tell you this, that I believe 100% that this pandemic, this COVID, this, it is, it is created and fathered by the enemy himself. The division that has brought, the, the way that is, I mean, look, can I tell you that used to believers would stand on the same side of things, but believers are fighting with each other worse than anybody right now. Who's at, the, who's, at the, who's at the authorship of that? Well, you may not know, so I'm going to help you. Revelation chapter 12. It's this understanding that we have this opportunity to overcome. We live in order. The enemy is an accuser. Think about this, the temptation of Jesus. The devil tempted Jesus to turn stones into bread, to which he replied, humans can't live on bread alone. Can you imagine after 40 days and 40 nights of fasting, being in the wilderness, in a dry and a desolate place, and the enemy, in Matthew 11, tempts Jesus, to which he responds and wins the victory. And the second one was, is Jesus throw yourself from the highest point of the temple in order that angels would catch you. And he replied, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Can I tell you, there are times that I get that out of order. When I bungee jumped in Zimbabwe, I thought that that was what the Lord was saying to me. You're a big boy, Johnny. I mean, I know that band, they said, hold a tow truck. but I mean, you, 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 you might be bigger than a tow truck. I mean, 
Whose voice is that? Not big as a tow truck. There's the enemy is the accuser and the tempter. And finally, the devil offers Jesus all the kingdoms of the world in return for worshiping him. And Jesus said, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. It's the tug of war. Paul makes this statement that I love in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For some of you today, it's going to be the most freeing thing when you understand this. What is condemnation? Condemnation is judgment requiring a punishment. Now, when he says there's now no condemnation, it doesn't mean that there's this sloppy grace. I mean, my goodness, Paul has gone to great lengths to say, we don't, just because grace abounds, we don't, sin doesn't abound the more. No, by no means is that the call. What he's saying is, is there's no condemnation in those who are in Christ Jesus. There's now no condemnation. So we got to understand Satan condemns us, right? Who's the one who condemns us? Satan condemns us. John 8, 44 says, there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of them. Look, Satan condemns us, but then wouldn't you say that we do a pretty good job of condemning ourselves, beating our own selves up because we got a tender conscience and we start saying crazy things like, well, you know, I've missed it so bad. Grace is not for me and I can't forgive myself. Listen to me. If Jesus will forgive you, you got to learn to forgive yourself. Satan is an expert at telling the unbeliever, what, what is, how does he bring condemnation? He's an expert in condemnation. He, he's an expert in condemnation because Satan will, will bring condemnation to two groups of people. He will bring condemnation to those who don't know God by convincing them that they are not condemned. If you don't need Jesus, live however you want. Do whatever you want. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you'll die. Isaiah 5, 20, the prophet says that he says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. He condemns a sect of people that God has created with a spirit, a soul and a body, condemns them by convincing them that there is no need for God. And it brings condemnation. But he brings condemnation to the second part, to the believer, that they are condemned. That's why Revelation 12 says in verse 10, the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. <laughs> he accuses you. He accuses me, a believer who follows Jesus, who lives for Jesus. He accuses you. Right? And it's nothing new. You understand that's what Job, the book of Job is about. Job was a righteous man before there was a church, <laughs> before there was a Bible study, before there was any written word. Job loved God. He was righteous before God. And he said, well, Job only loves you. He only serves you, God, because of what you give him. He's an accuser. Listen to me. The difference between you and me and God is God knows the motive of our heart. And there's a lot of times in life that we think that serving Jesus is to get a better income, get a better house, get a better car, all those things. Can I tell you that it is the, there are times where the blessing and the favor of God are a byproduct of an obedient life. But it's not the definition of an obedient life. When I got laid off from a job, was I blessed or was I cursed? No, I just got laid off. When I had a nice car, am I blessed or am I cursed? No, I just got a car. If my car is breaking down, am I blessed or am I cursed? No, my car just broke down. These things don't define whether I'm blessed or I'm cursed because I'm blessed by my position and my theology is correct because God saved me, he's restoring me and he's creating an appetite in me for his righteousness. And that's got nothing to do with what I drive. I like what I drive, but it don't define me. I 
I love this next part it says to Revelations 12, verse 10, and then, and then 11. It says, and they have conquered him, him being the accuser of the brother, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. I love that. I love how we have an opportunity. Do you want to know how I know that the enemy's not going to win in my life? Because the faithfulness of God has been too strong for me to turn my back on him now. The testimony. Like, I, I, there is no plan B. <laughs> I remember preaching. I'm sorry. I remember being preached to in a youth, uh, a youth, uh, a youth camp service. And, and he was calling out the leaders there in front of the students and and I got to tell you, I, I beat myself up pretty bad that week. My first position, I started with a youth group of seven kids in my very first position. And out of those seven kids, four of them had boycotted the youth group the week before, like with picket signs. That's crazy. It, church people be crazy sometimes. <laughs> They had painted on his car, they had written on his car, mama's boy and all this stuff. And I'm going to just tell you, I haven't been saved that long in my first position. And I know the Lord knew that I wouldn't pass that test. Because I would have shown up, got Pentecostal, and laid some hands on some people. You'd be like, you're so fleshly. Look, I'm a process, all right? I'm in a process. I can remember moment. It, it was a very, 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 very challenging thing. But I go to camp that summer, and I take the biggest group that they had had in that church ever go to camp. We had to have a friend of mine come from another church. There's another youth pastor, and we put people in there and put our luggage and stuff in their trailer too. And we took the biggest group, and I go to this camp, and there are um, there are legends ahead of me whose groups are are, are very big. And everybody's like, oh, this person's so great. And, this, and, and I started feeling like, man, I'll never be as good as them. Now, I wasn't leading with this. This is, not how you, this is not how you lead in friendship, by the way. I didn't meet them and go, I'll never be as good as you. But just remember the little people, little peons like me. I'm like, it'll make you do stupid stuff. It'll make you try to dress like them. Make you think that they're your standard. And, and some of them became my closest friends. But I learned lessons from that. I learned lessons that I'm not going to ignore the person whose group's not as big as mine because every one of us are living the assignment in the season of life of where God has called us to and we're trying to figure it out. I beat myself up in that camp and the, and the speaker's going and he was preaching a message called Ring the Bell and he says, he's, he, he comes to me and, and, and I'd love to say it was the Lord speaking through him but the way he talked to me, I wanted to believe it was the devil. And he said something to the effect, come on, Johnny, just quit. Just quit. You'll never be as good. I mean, your daddy, think about who your daddy was. Think about, this man knows me from nobody. Come on, just ring the bell, tap out. He was doing this ring the bell kind of analogy, like the Navy SEALs, and they ring the bell and quit because they're not cut out for it. And, and I'm sitting there, and he's, he said, come on, quit, just ring. And I was like, I can't quit. So why? Because... There is no plan B. Jesus is the plan. I didn't call me, so I can't uncall myself. <laughs> I didn't save me, so I don't want to live a life that's not obedient to him. Look, when, there's, when you understand that the enemy is the accuser and the tempter, you understand the battle in which you are fighting. See, condemnation, y'all, is hopeless. It's an always and never be good enough. You'll always be this. You'll never. But conviction is hopeful. There's a difference between condemnation and conviction. He didn't say there is therefore now no conviction. He says there is therefore now no condemnation. And condemnation is, is a, you'll always be a failure. Listen to me. You won't always be a failure because failure is not who someone is. It's not who you are. It's an event in your life. It's not who you are. But conviction is hopeful. Condemnation, listen to me, this is big. Condemnation is general. It's everything. But conviction is specific. I love that about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't just go, well, you know, there's, 
there's this maybe couple things you're missing it in and you're just a failure. Oh, thank you, Spirit of God, for speaking to me and giving me no clue what I'm supposed to work on. <laughs> now, the Holy Spirit says, hey, places a finger on the issue and says, that ought to not be in the life of a son or a daughter of God. I love that about conviction. There are times when people will say, man, I just, well, they just, they treat this whole Christian walk thing at celebration a little too serious. Yeah, because it's our vision to lead people in an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm glad that you're here. I'm so thankful that you're here. But being in attendance is not the end goal. Living a life that is in order is the goal. So when I preach a message that may be challenging, I'll, I'll ask my wife, babe, was that hard? Was that a hard message? She's like, oh, okay, look. Sometimes she's like, ah. So what I start doing, I start smiling more. Lord created you not to live. We shouldn't be living less than what he died for. They're like, oh, that was mean, but he was nice. I like that. He made me feel good about missing it. No, my goal is not to make you feel good about not living in obedience. My goal is that we would live convicted. Look, we all need to be challenged, amen? I mean, what would church be if there was never a challenge or a decree? What would the word of God be if he never called us higher? Just food for thought. Condemnation will finalize, want to create this finalized idea in our mind that we'll never be good enough. But conviction is an opportunity. Can I tell you, when you're trying to figure out which voice is which, I can tell you this, the voice of God will always call you to do something that will bring you closer to Jesus. But the voice of the enemy will always be the voice that keeps you complacent and comfortable. I mean, I was called to ministry when, when I heard a voice say, get on your knees on the side of the bed and pray. And I was like, devil, I rebuke that. I'm already praying as I lay. I was a pillow prophet at the moment. And then I got to having this conversation with myself. Did you ever do that? <laughs> I'm having, a few of you are brave enough to admit it. The rest of you are like, I ain't saying nothing. Nobody think I'm crazy. They already think you're crazy. There's, I'm having this conversation with myself. It's not out loud, but in my mind. I'm like, man, devil's trying to get, trying to get me to, devil trying to get me out to bed and on my knees praying to Jesus. And I was like, wait, the devil wouldn't ask me to do anything that puts me in a posture of humility. He would rather me stay in a posture of complacency to create humiliation. I got on my knees. That was the night that God called me to preach the gospel. Condemnation will always lead us to want to cover up where we missed it, but conviction will call us to uncover so the grace of God can then cover us. So as I close today, you're like, are you picking with us? Are you really going to close? You know what in closing means. I want you to write these down if you're taking notes. Therefore, there is now no condemnation of those that are in Christ Jesus. And the end of that chapter, right? The end of that, the end of that passage says, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So how do we miss it? Write this down. Our bad theology is normally a cover-up for our bad living. Bad theology is a cover-up for bad living. When we're living bad, we want to find justification for the way we're living. And that brings condemnation because it's a lie. But conviction in theology says, God, not my will, but yours be done. Listen to me. 
Good theology is this, that Christ made us new. A new relationship. That's why he says Christ is in you. He gives us a new mind. Mind, not on the things of the flesh, but mind on the things of the spirit. He gives us a new nature. He gives us new desires. He gives us a new power. Thank the Lord he gives us a new life. The old has passed and the new has come. And a new destiny. A life that was destined for hell to a life that is destined for heaven. See, the new will end in the perfect. We're not perfect now, but the new will end there for an eternity with God. So let's get rid of bad theology by not justifying bad living. Is that cool? You get that? Let's just agree on that. The second is this. Let's be honest Christians. <laughs> I mean, Paul just spent a whole chapter talking about his life before and the war that happens within, the carnality of it. Let's be honest Christians. See, the carnal Christian says you're forgiven but not changed, that Jesus is Savior but not Lord. And I can tell you that he's either Lord or he's not Savior. Remember, most bad theology is a cover-up for bad behavior. He doesn't give me no condemnation so I can live however. He gives me no condemnation so I don't live in shame and victimization. But an honest Christian says, I may not be perfect, but thank God I'm new. That God has changed me. That God has changed you. And thank God that he's not finished with us. Right? A hypocrite is not a believer that struggles, but a believer who acts like they don't struggle. I'll say that again. A hypocrite, a Christian, all of us are going through something. Is there anybody perfect in the room? If you're online, I want you to raise that little hand they do in the emoji if you're perfect. So that way we can have a conversation. Because if you're perfect, you need to go and write a book and retire. So I don't stand on this platform. The one thing about our church, I don't stand on this platform and act like I'm perfect, but I can tell you this, I wanna love Jesus for real. And so I'm not perfect, but I'm new. And Paul said, for me, to follow, for you to follow me as I follow Christ means that you have to die daily. To die daily. Be an honest Christian. Look, Lord's not finished with me. If you miss it, you apologize. Hey, forgive me. I, I missed that. Please don't hold me a prisoner for something where I missed it because I'm sorry I repented to God. Now I'm repenting to you. And last but not least, you'd be like, oh, you are closing. Yeah. There is now no condemnation. Therefore, there is now no condemnation in those that are in Christ Jesus. Can I tell you that you need to get this in your spirit today? The best is yet to come. Do you have new desires that want to do what God says? I hope so. Do you trust and want to learn the word of God? I hope so. Is your inner being sometimes at war against your outer desires, your, your flesh? Yes. Do you know what is right in your mind and get frustrated when you don't do it in your body? Yes. Do you hate when you're in the flesh, but you want to live in the spirit? Hello, anger. But the best is yet to come. So are you thankful that Jesus Christ is your Lord? The best is yet to come, y'all, because he is not finished with you. Philippians 1, 6, he tells the church of Philippi, he says, I'm convinced and confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will and continue to perfect and complete it until the day of Christ Jesus, the time of his return. I want you to stand with me today. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Even when I don't see it, I'm thankful for that relationship that we get to have. It's a privilege and an honor, amen? It is a privilege and an honor. And today may be one of the most life-giving messages that I can preach to you. There
is therefore now no condemnation in those that are in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I don't want bad theology. I want good theology. (laughs) I want to be an honest Christian. That God's working on me. And I'm I'm, I'm going to get forgiveness and I'm going to get redemption and I'm not going to repeat the process. Because the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. There's not a spouse in this room that wouldn't love their spouse more for honesty and love and encouragement and genuineness and and authenticity. There's not a church that would ever be held back with this authenticity that we have an opportunity for. He's not finished with us. And we get a chance to live led by conviction and not condemnation. So I'm not going to allow the enemy to accuse me to a future where there is no hope. But I want the conviction of the Holy Spirit to saturate our souls in this room today. That if we need to be convicted about surrendering our lives fully to Jesus, then let conviction happen. If we need to be convicted about an area that is not godly, then may the Holy Spirit place a finger on that area so we can live in order. I don't want to live out of order, neither do you. I don't want to live in condemnation. I want to live in conviction. I want to live in the newness. I want to live in the opportunity that God makes all things new. That the old has passed away and behold, He's made us new. That I'm a new creature in Christ. So today, will you receive that? I want every head bowed and every eye closed. Today. Today, will you have a moment right where you are and think about the order in which you live your life it's got to start with a spirit that must be redeemed today some of you need to be saved some of you need to be saved and all you have to do is call on the mighty name of Jesus and ask him not just to be your savior but to be your Lord and savior all control the reins to every area of your life, nothing hidden or attempted to be hidden from him. You pray that prayer today. Lord, save me, deliver me, make me new. In Jesus' name, it will be the trampoline effect into a life that is destined for him. There's some of you today, you've been kind of living in this way, this kind of confusion, and your theology's gotten a little warped, but I can tell you that the conviction of the Holy Spirit wants to place a finger on the mystheology of your life and say, hey, this will stop in Jesus' name, and you will start honoring God. And I believe a lot of us are at that place today where we say it stops here, and the grace and the righteousness, the redemption and the restoration, it starts now. May that be what happens. Come on, I want you. If you just need something from the Lord today, if you need something, you need a fresh touch in your body. You need a fresh touch in your spirit. You need a fresh touch in your soul to be restored. Your emotions are playing tricks on you. You don't know how to feel and you feel all over the place. Can I tell you, there is a, there is a God in heaven who has made a way where the enemy wants you to think there is no way. And he wants you to receive today. He wants you to receive newness. He wants you to receive redemption. He wants you to receive restoration. And he wants you to walk in obedience. And today, if you say, Pastor, I want to obey that. I want to walk in that obedience. I want to walk in that surrender. And I want to walk in that newness. Then today, there is nothing holding you back from that moment but yourself. So today... Would you seal the deal and walk in that moment? Father, in the name of Jesus, may you have your way in this house. May we be drawn close to your heart. Lord, through your Spirit's power, God, may we feel conviction this morning and no condemnation. For Lord, our hope is in you and our trust is in you. So God, today, may you, may you have your way in every area of our life. Today, God, not just in general, but the Holy Spirit will speak specifically today. And God, may our ears be open and our hearts ready to receive that specific moment that you have. Lord, today, may we receive it. May we receive it. Come on. Don't quit now. Don't clock out now. Receive what God has for you. You've been carrying this oppression and and, and this memory and this hurt and this pain. It's time to let God and let go. 
You've been walking defined by your past and your past is behind you. You can't do anything about it. So walk in the newness of who God has created you to be. It's time. It's time. And the best is yet to come. So Lord, today, Lord, we receive your word. We receive your word. We receive your encouragement. We receive your empowerment that we would become everything you've called us to be. And it starts from a decision made today. From this moment, from this moment, God, may we go and be who you've called us to be. We're not looking for an excuse, Lord. We're looking for a solution. We're not just spotting the problem and the Holy Spirit placing a finger on it. God, we're walking in the newness and we're walking in this hope. We're walking in this power. We're walking in this encouragement. So God, may you do your work your way. So Lord, may you smile on your people today. May you grant us wisdom. May you grant us power. May you give us the grace and the mercy, Lord, to walk in the fullness of the truth of who you are. God, have your way in our lives. And we ask it today in Jesus' master's name. And everybody said, amen.